Good morning. Uh, we still got the, the plates are moving back a little bit, so. Well, if you have been following along in this wonderful journey this year through the story that changes everything, the Bible from start to finish, I have good news for you. You are on the home stretch. For the past several months, we have journeyed from the beginning of all things creation through a season of, of ancient history, prophetic literature, poetry, the Gospels, and then this big section of Pauline epistles, letters written from Paul to all these churches and people scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And now we are arriving at a section of letters commonly referred to as the general epistles. These are letters written by a variety of authors to a variety of folks. But mostly, one of the most important things to know is that these are written to a lot of people, to a general audience. So where, where Paul's letters often are written to the Galatians or the Colossians or the Corinthians, folks who lived in a very specific city with a very specific set of circumstances in their, their towns, the ways that they related to the Roman Empire, the ways that he even, th those, those things around them shaped their imaginations regarding the church. We are now moving to a place where we don't need quite as much heavy lifting in terms of contextualization and understanding of some of the unique things that made these letters so particularly important at a time and place. Particularly important, yes, for a time and place, but also, right, echoing back to us today. Now we have moved to letters which are addressed just like our letter today is from James to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. All the Jewish Christians that live all scattered throughout the Roman Empire, but take heart, it's not just Jewish Christians that this letter is written for, because we too, as inheritors, as children of God, we are also part of the dispersion. So these words that we will have today echo through the centuries to us in your seat right now, perfectly applicable in every way through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Ooh, the Bible's cool. Now, by virtue of the fact that it's a little more broadly written for us today, we're, we're going to spend a little more time just interacting with the text. And the book of James is written in a much more direct fashion than some of the other New Testament letters. It's, it's pretty bold. It's kind of in your face at times. Which makes sense, considering the author, as we historically presume it to be, is James, the brother of Jesus. Or half-brother would probably be technically more correct. Now, James was also the leader of the Jerusalem church, carried a lot of authority. And so if anyone has sort of the burden, the disposition, the leadership position to bring a hard, challenging word to all the believers, it would certainly be a figure like James. Academically speaking, historically speaking, something you might know about the book of James that is really more of a, an infamous fact. And, and Diane spoke about this a few, well, I guess it's now months perhaps, when, when she did the book of Romans. But Martin Luther, the Martin Luther, he hated the book of James. He despised it. He called it famously, and I quote, an epistle of straw. When he translated the, the, the Bible, he put James at the very end, after Revelation. This is true. Kind of spoke to how little, how, how little regard he gave it. And we don't have to work hard to understand why Luther specifically so despised the book of James and the, the language that James uses to challenge the Christian life. Recall, right, Martin Luther exists in an atmosphere of a, a Roman Catholicism that was sort of state-sponsored and really legalistic and often oppressive, connecting indulgences and deeds and actions to salvation in a way that Martin Luther, when he's reading the text, reading Romans, is convicted and says, this is absolutely not what Christ has for us. And instead, he declares the doctrine of sola fide, Latins, only faith, only faith. It is by faith alone that we are saved. So we resist this idea that we have to do all of these things that the church might demand of us in order to know that we are justified before Christ, counted as righteous. Well, James sort of looks a lot to Martin Luther like someone who relies heavily on the idea of a deeds-associated faith. And we're going to read that in just a moment. So for Martin Luther, the, several problems arise. For, for one, James never mentions the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He finds an issue with that. And also, James says very bluntly, 
faith without works is dead. Well, we can understand why Mr. Martin would have a bit of a problem with that. That seems to be the opposite of sola fide. So we can understand where he is coming from. But, and, and I mean this with all respect to Martin, as we would not be here without him, right? L- literally probably wouldn't be here without him. A good reading of James does not have to lead us to the conclusion that, that James is in conflict with Paul or that he doesn't fully affirm the death and resurrection and gospel truth of Jesus Christ's life. What James ultimately seems to be concerned with, though, is a Christian faith that is all talk and no transformation. All, all head stuff, but no hands and feet in the world. See, what we might infer from the book of James is that there are folks living within this context of the Roman Empire, and it's, and it's dangerous to be a Christian. It's dangerous to be subversive in the ways that the Christian faith calls us to be subversive. So they might show up to church on Sundays, and they might participate in worship, but unfortunately, they leave the gathering of believers and simply look, seem as though they forget all about what it is that Christ has done for them. And James is pretty mad about that. And you can imagine, given his familiarity with the person of Jesus Christ, it's very personal for him. The stakes are high. This is important, people. And that's very much the tone that he carries through the letter. So James, I would say, is not in conflict with Paul, but rather is in conversation with Paul, hoping to open up and elaborate on the principles that Paul has outlined in in Romans chapter 4. And we're going to see that he is in direct dialogue, in fact, with Romans chapter 4. And, of course, James is not ignoring the death and resurrection of Christ. In fact, there is perhaps no other text in the New Testament that seems to be so vividly aware of the Sermon on the Mount. As we read the book of James, we see that he is referring back to principles that Jesus illustrates throughout the Sermon on the Mount about anxiety and fear and trouble and practical sin, judging your neighbor. These are all principles that he is pounding over and over again in the book of James. And so ultimately, where Paul is going to to say that Abraham's faith is reckoned to him as righteousness, James is going to say, absolutely. And then you know what happened? He did something about it. And so it is not the sense that there is something missing from Paul that James feels like he needs to argue with. Instead, it is this idea that as we are continuing to move forward, we have to have a sharpening and a refining of what it is that Christ is doing within us so that we might then in turn be his hands and feet in the world. And as he's going to say, it's not that Abraham's faith relied solely, right, on his works, but instead that his works brought them to completion, brought his faith to perfection, if you will. Now, I, I want to try something this morning. And I've been anxiously pondering it all week. Mostly, I will admit, it's out of, it's out of a, a self-pride sort of thing. Because what I want to do this morning, and I'm going to invite you to do this with me, is I just want to read to you the entirety of the book of James. You know, several weeks ago, as I began to really seriously prepare for this Sunday, I was reading through the text, feeling burdened by passage after passage that spoke to me in a different way. And I felt convicted that that what other time might you have this week to gather together as the church has done for centuries upon centuries upon centuries? to come together as a body and to listen to the words of an apostle written specifically for you, right? In the early church, this was what happened. The the letters showed up and they said, hey, we got a letter from James. And the church would gather and they would sit and attend to this powerful message being spoken by the Spirit through his servants. And I think today we have just enough time for us to do it. And it's rare that we have a, a, a text that is both perfectly short and long to fill that space. And so I have gone through the book of James this week. And you might be saying, wow, were you a little busy here, Grant? You got to fill about 20 minutes. Busy this week, didn't have original thought. And that's where the pride comes in. Because I don't want you to think that I'm just filling space because I ran out of things to say. Trust me, I have things to say. (laughs) But I thought in this season of hearing from different voices and different folks filling this pulpit, that it might be a fun change to hear directly from the mouth of James, the brother of Jesus. I feel like we can pause enough to listen to the whole thing he has to say, can't we? So this week, I've, I've been reading through various translations, even gone back to the Greek in some cases. And so what you're going to hear today is not an authorized translation, although it borrows heavily from a few. 
So I'd encourage you, as you might feel tempted to follow along in your version, it's not going to be the same. I can just tell you that. And I invite you to, to inhabit the same posture that maybe those early Christians did, where they simply sat and received and heard the message. So if you would, this is the book of James, the letter of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face various trials, consider it all joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance complete its work so that you may be complete and whole and perfected, lacking in nothing. And if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given you. But ask in faith, never doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, often being double-minded and unstable in so many ways, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now let the brother or sister of humble means boast in having a high position, and the rich in turn boast in being humbled. Because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field. For the sun rises with its scorching heat, And it withers the field, its flower falls, its beauty perishes. It's the same way with the rich. In the midst of a busy life, they will wither away. Now, blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test, test, withstanding the pressure, and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to all those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, oh, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by your own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Now, don't be deceived My beloved brothers and sisters, every generous act of giving, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave birth to us by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creation. Now you must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Why? For human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and growth of wickedness in your lives, and instead welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But in keeping after that grace, that word that is saving your soul, also be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. Hmm. They look at themselves and upon going away, immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Now, if any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes, who is popular and beautiful and influential, comes into your church body, 
And also, if a poor person in dirty clothes with great need, maybe needs a bit of a shower, also comes in. And if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, oh, well, here's a seat right on the front row in a very good place. Please come. While to the one who is poor, you say, could you just stand in the back for a bit? Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brother and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor person. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not the rich who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable then for all of it. For the one who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you have still become a transgressor of the law entirely. And you are under the law's judgment entirely. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, of freedom. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but does, does, does not have any behavior to back it up? Surely that faith cannot save, can it? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, oh, go in peace, good luck, keep warm and eat your fill, and you don't actually do anything to help them, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works to back it up, it's dead. But someone will say, they'll say back to me, you have faith and I have works. Yeah. Show me your faith apart from works and I, by my works, by my behavior, will show you my faith. Now you believe God is one. You believe in the truth of the gospel. You do well, very good. But even the demons believe and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart, from the, faith apart from works is worthless? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And by works, his faith was brought to completion or perfection. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not just faith alone. Likewise was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers from the Israelites and then sent them out secretly by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes is, in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. Now, if we put bits, right, into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Uh, they are so large, they're driven by strong winds, and yet they're guided by a very small rudder that behaves according to the will of the pilot who directs it. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. <sighs> How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed upon, among our body parts as a world of iniquity. <laughs> It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and it itself is a fire set by hell. For every species of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but it seems no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we also curse people, people who have been made in the likeness of God. 
from the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse? My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salty or horrible brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives? Or can a grapevine produce figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Who's wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, the ones that you all know about, the tea that you're sipping, where do those things come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts and lawsuits. But you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask selfishly in order to spend what you get, in order to take my gifts, the gifts of God, and use them for your own selfish desires. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity and conflict with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world will in turn become an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that the scripture speaks to no purpose, that the word of God is a lie, perhaps? Does the spirit that God caused to dwell in us, the Holy Spirit, does it produce in us envy and in turn desire the things of this world? No. But God gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know what you ought to do for a change? Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves, therefore, below the, before the Lord. Bring yourselves low, and you know what he will do? He will lift you up out of mourning and into holy laughter. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges according to the law. But if you judge according to the law, you are not a doer of the law. You're a judge. There is only one lawgiver and one judge who is able to save and to destroy. And you have chosen the wrong time to pretend to be like him. So then... Who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now. All of you who say, oh, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there. We'll do business and make lots and lots of money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know the future. What's your life? You know what it is? It's a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, what you should say, if the Lord wills it for my life, I will live by his will and do this or that. But as it is right now, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, they're committing sin. They're stepping away from the desires that God has for their life. Now I wanna repeat this for everybody. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted, your clothes are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You hear me? 
you have laid up treasure meaninglessly in the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you decided to keep back out of selfish fraud, those wages cry out and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have nourished your hearts in a day of slaughter. And by doing so, you have condemned and also murdered the righteous one who did not resist you. Be patient, therefore, my brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, don't grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge, capital J, judge, is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who showed endurance. You've heard of the endurance of Job, and you've seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. For the Lord is faithful and compassionate and full of mercy. Above all, brothers and sisters, do not swear, either by heaven or or by earth or by any other oath. But instead, let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise, turning everything back to the Lord. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, without fear, without shame, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human like us, and and he prayed frequently, fervently, that it might not rain for three years and six months. And, And you know what? It didn't rain on the earth. And then he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. I think as you listen to these words today, you can maybe catch a bit of what made Martin Luther so uncomfortable. Because as, as, as James says in chapter 1, his conviction is that we must be doers of the word and not only hearers of the word. Here's the unfortunate thing and why I think the message of James as brash and straightforward and cutting as it can feel is so important for us. It's that we are filled in a world with a lot of folks who profess belief in Christ who look in the mirror and see themselves and then walk away forgetting what they look like. It's very easy at times to play at a sort of faith life, but what James would actually ask us is, how is that then transforming you for the world? So it is not that James protests against Paul's point that we are justified through faith alone. Sola fide, sounds like the start of an opera, a beautiful opera. It is not that James disagrees with Martin Luther's point. It's that James would profound, or excuse me, James disagrees with Paul's point, ultimately. It's that James wants us to then do something with our justified self, to move from this place of living within grace and forgiveness and peace that surpasses understanding, to then understand that Jesus Christ has called us to take what he has done in us and go and put it to work. And not to sit idly by while the world moves past us or when it's a chance for our convictions to speak into the world, we go silent because we don't understand what we look like or what we ought to look like because we've walked away from the mirror and have forgotten entirely what Christ has done for us. I feel like I remember Jesus saying something about this to a church in Revelation. What was it? You are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, and I will what? Spit you out. Or recall the teachings of Jesus, the parable of the talents, 
The master goes, he entrusts great wealth to his servants. And the ones who, who risk it, who put it out into the world, who seek to see it grow and see a return, they are excited when the master gets back to tell them what they've done. But there's one who doesn't have the courage to engage in the world with the gifts that he's been given by his master. Instead, he's afraid and he buries it. And when the master comes back, who is he most happy with? The ones who have taken the risk and been brave and allowed the peace of Christ to transform their, their lives so they could go out and be Christ's hands and feet in the world. And the one with whom the master is most upset is the one who takes that treasure, that talent, and buries it. We have been given a charge to go and change the world, to be his disciples, to be his hands and feet, to take the things that we know in our heads, that we know in our hearts, and to go out and allow that to move through us. And James senses the tension that can happen when we allow ourselves to get in this comfortable place. Gossip, slander, favoritism, partiality, an overemphasis on wealth as something valuable before the Lord. Has that changed? I would submit no. And so today, as we seek to understand this beautiful message of James, one that is hard, but hard in good ways, my conviction is that we are being called through his words to understand what it means to want to go into the world and to do something with ourselves, to do something with this grace that we've received, to preach the mercy that we have received that can be extended to all others because at the end of the day, mercy triumphs over judgment. But for James, the issue is there's nobody seems to be acting like it. So as we receive that word today, I want to challenge you. What are you doing with this grace that you have received? If James were to walk into the room today, would he need to talk to you about your tongue? The things you've allowed yourselves to say and do? Now, importantly, it's not about a list of things that therefore means you've earned the faith, right? That is not what James is trying to say. Notice what he says. Purest religion, the one that is from above, is two things. Taking care of the orphan and the widow, the needy, the ones who are pushed to the side, the ones who desperately could use love, affection, resources, you rich people. And also, keeping yourself undefiled by the things of the world. Resisting the temptation to take all of the things that James has covered, language, status, wealth, and to say these things are not valuable to us. We live in a different vision of the world, one that is reconciled and restored to God through Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, we do not take those things and allow them to define us or the ways that we view other people. Instead, what we do is we seek to find those who desperately need the truth of the gospel and to identify those things that could come into our hearts and move us away from the truth of the gospel and we say, time to get rid of those things and to go find the people that really need help. Amen. That's it. It's punchy. I don't think James need an editor, needs an editor to punch it up at all anymore, okay? We feel it. So as the team comes to lead us in a song as we close, I do just invite you again to consider what it might be in your own life. What it might be that you and I are being invited to give up, to yield to analyze our, our life's story and to say, wow, we've really missed it here. And to pull it out, to uproot it and allow the word of God to be implanted in us and to flourish and prosper. What is that thing? And then in turn, God, make me your hands and feet. Give me eyes to see the orphan, the widow, the one in desperate need, the one who has been pushed aside, the places in this world that so desperately need God's justice. Give me conviction for those things, Lord. Give me the words to say that I might not just be quiet, forgetting what I looked like as I was transformed by Jesus Christ. Let me have the courage to speak, the courage to do the word and not hear it only. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the words of your servant, James, today. We need you. We need you to give us the courage to speak when you want to have your voice heard in this world. Give us courage to see with your eyes. Give us courage 
that our feet might take us to the places where you are so desperately needed and hands in turn, courage in our hands to give anything that is needed. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for this text for us. Help us to figure out what it means to build our lives on you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing, offer our lives to him this morning. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring.
to the voice of James today. I hope that what you've heard is this. You are justified by faith in Christ alone. But in turn, that faith, that mercy and grace that has been extended to you ought to be transforming your hearts and lives in a way that clearly, definitely is noticeable in the world around you. And there's not a list of things that that looks like that we demand as members of the Christian faith that you, you do a certain set of actions in order to show that you have been justified. But instead, it's very simple. Care for those who desperately need care and keep yourselves away from things that are going to defile the witness of Christ in your life. Give all of those things to him. You know what, to borrow a line, Around here, we just call that the sanctified life because that is what it means to be sanctified through and through. So receive this benediction today. Therefore, may the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May our whole spirit, souls, and bodies be kept sound and blameless before the day of the coming of our Lord. And take heart because he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion and he will surely do it. Amen. Go in his peace today.